Hi, um, we're going to talk about hypertension and sodium and also the work of Richard Moore, a hypertension, great hypertension researcher. So starting out, hypertension is the most important disease. It's sort of the gateway disease to health hell. Um, it's the main cause of atherosclerosis and dementia and it's a preventable thing in the vast majority of situations. It's the uh, number one risk factor, cerebral atherosclerosis and dementia. When blood pressure is too high, a person is at risk to you know, burst a blood vessel of intracranial bleed. That's very rare. I hardly ever see that. I look at brains every day. Um, what's much more common is blood pressure too low on a chronic basis, and that's chronic cerebral hypotension leading to dementia. You can also get tiny little bleeds, cerebral micro bleeds from high uh, chronic hypotension. Um, hypertension is mostly caused by an excess of dietary fat and sodium. So that's something you need to know. Excessive dietary fat and sodium cause hypertension. That's a key thing to know. Excessive dietary fat also causes insulin resistance leading to diabetes. Excessive dietary fat also tends to make people fat. The more fat percent in your diet, the faster a person gets fat. Sodium is a vasoconstrictor, so it tightens up arteries. And when it tightens up the artery, you have to have more blood pressure to pump the blood through. So for that reason, sodium increases blood pressure. Um, does a few other things we're going to talk about as well. We talked about Wing Kessel effect in the atherosclerosis or, um, lectures. The ascending thoracic aorta is like a second heart. It has a lot of elastic fibers. It stores the energy of cardiac contraction, systole that's called. And then during diastole, when cardiac relaxes, the heart relaxes, elastic recoil fibers uh, push the blood along to maintain diastolic flow. Um, and usually it's not until after you've lost those elastic fibers in the ascending thoracic aorta called the Wing Kessel effect that you start getting uh, significant atherosclerosis. Um, and the more chronic the hypertension, the less reversible it is. So, you know, you want to diagnose it and start being aware of it and doing things to minimize it. The sooner, the better. Um, eventually, after decades and decades, the elastic fibers are gone, the arteries become calcified, and they're also the small arteries are hypertrophic with uh, hypertrophy of the smooth muscle cells, fibrotic tissue around them, and then they're less flexible. So the more decades it goes on, the harder it is to reverse it. But it's often reversible initially. Okay, just a quick couple of definitions. A baby's born with about a 90 over 60 blood pressure, maybe 95 over 60. And in a population that eats plant-based, low-fat, um, without adding any salt, they keep the same blood pressure their entire life. It might go up a little bit, but not much. It's about the same their entire life. In some populations, there's a tendency for it to go down a little bit in the old years. Bottom line, they have close to zero hypertension. Uh, these are some categories. Uh, let's say hypertension, 140 over 90, three consecutive visits to the doctor office. And basically, some docs will even like it, like Dr. McDougall says, he'll wait till it's 160 and it's stayed that high. Uh, for a couple of months before he'll initiate uh, pharmaceutical treatment. Um, on an individual basis, one can optimize their diet and lifestyle and uh, potentially get it under control. Quite often that's effective. Um, just a quick picture of two blood pressure curves. Here's a green normal blood pressure curve, uh, like about you know 110 peak systolic and 70 during the diastolic resting phase of the heart. Here's a, some severe hypertension with a peak systolic of 200 millimeters mercury over 100. Um, and then here's just showing that a red blood cell is a little bit bigger than a capillary. But a red blood cell is about 7 microns. Capillary is about 5 microns, meaning that it has to deform a little bit to pass through the capillary. So if those RBCs are stiff due to excessive saturated fat, for example, in the diet, blood pressure is going to have to go up to push them through. If those red blood cells are all stuck together because there's fat, Globbing onto them, sticking them together, uh, blood pressure is going to have to go up to pump them through the system. Some of the stuff I know a lot of you already know this, so I'll just go through it real quick for the audience that hasn't seen it before. The higher LDL cholesterol is, the thicker the blood is, the more uh, blood viscosity one has. RBCs have negative charges all around them from their sialic acid residues on their glycocalyx, such that they repel each other. And then things like LDL cholesterol with a positive charge will overcome that zeta potential, that negative charge, and stick them together. And there are several different things that will do that, including fibrinogen, uric acid, IgM antibodies in the acute infection phase. 
Okay, here's just a quick picture of Rouleau formation. It's the French word for stack of coins, meaning when there's some bridging molecule, like from fat, LDL cholesterol, fibrinogen, IgM antibodies, uric acid, they're going to stick those red blood cells together, and now it's going to be harder to push them through the, the blood vessels and the capillary, so pressure has to go up, and you're going to lose this normal uh, laminar flow parabolic velocity profile, and that's going to cause injury to the arterial lining cells, the endothelium. Yeah, and this talk is going to be mostly about sodium, but I had to give this introductory material uh, to make sure everybody at least uh, knows this much on it. Um, laminar flow coming up the common carotid artery, hits a bifurcation, external carotid to the face, internal carotid artery to the brain. And the point being that this happens in all bifurcations throughout the body, including the coronary arteries. The high pressure blood hits the median divider between the branches here. And that causes chaotic turbulent flow. It also causes retrograde flow like eddy currents. And those will tend to confuse and injure the lining cells of the artery, endothelium cells. So it will release its antithrombotic uh, surface molecules and start to express prothrombotic molecules. And you'll start to form a blood clot on the side away from the median divider. So that's how atherosclerosis begins. It begins as a blood clot due to arterial lining cells, endothelial cells, being injured by hypertension. That is the number one common important thing to know about initiation of atherosclerosis, that it begins with hypertension and typically from thick blood due to high fat and also from vasoconstriction due to sodium. Um, there's a whole bunch more on atherosclerosis. I talk about that in my other, I got two uh, atherosclerosis lectures, but that's a good thing to know, just this uh, basic aspect of it. Endothelial cell has a lot of functions. Most important thing to know is so endothelial just means lining cell of an artery. The most important thing to realize is that it secretes nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator and it also prevents platelet aggregation. It does everything good that you want in an artery. There's other things that happen in endothelial cell to protect it from thrombosis and whatnot, but nitric oxide is the only one we really need to talk about. Okay, now we're going to start getting into the sodium stuff, which I think is the, the most interesting part of this talk. Um, the average American's probably eating in a ballpark of 7,000 milligrams per day. Um, and there's a lot of hypertension. Uh, most of the sodium that people eat comes from processed food. There's tons of sodium in processed food. Um, somebody who's eating at 2,000 calories of processed food, and people eat a lot more than that quite often, that can have 10,000 milligrams of sodium in it. And just for perspective, if somebody ate a purely plant-based uh, diet, they'd have around 200 to 500 milligrams per day. The Yanomamo in South America, they only eat, they're like a population that lives in the jungles, they don't have any contact with the cities, they only eat about 200 milligrams a day of sodium. And what I'm getting at is a westernized diet is sort of ridiculous in its understanding of sodium. A so-called low sodium diet is actually 2,000 milligrams per day, which is 10 times what people eat in a natural environment of 200 milligrams per day. Um, and again, William C. Roberts, famous cardiac pathologist, described uh, populations that blood pressure essentially stays about the same as when they're a baby, 90 over 60 all through their life. And some other populations, they'll be 110 over 70 and whatnot in their um, elderly years. But, and there's some who goes down a little bit. The bottom line is it stays normal their entire life. And by normal, I mean 110 over 70 or less, entire life. In comparison, in Americans, at 60 years of age, about 60% of hypertension. And hypertension numbers, they're kind of similar to impotence numbers. And that would make sense because atherosclerosis goes with hypertension. And so does impotence. So basically, the impotence numbers for American men are about 30% in their 30s, 40% in their 40s, 50% in their 50s, 60% in their 60s, 70% in their 70s. And, you know, it's in that ballpark for hypertension. Of course, there's some variability depending on the definitions and whatnot, but you get the point. It's super common. And the good news, it's, it's easy to prevent. Um, other populations have uh, similar findings, and it's pretty much any plant-based population that stuck with their old diets and stayed away from all the modern processed food and readily available sodium and high-fat foods and excess of meat amounts, they all have good blood pressures. They all have almost zero hypertension. And this includes the Tatahumata in northern Mexico, Sierra Madre, Copper Canyon area. Um, we've compared them in a recent epidemiology lecture to the Pima, who have tons of hypertension and problems because they eat the SAD diet, and they live in Arizona now. They used to be demographically matched with the Tatahumata. Polynesian Islanders, uh, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, even if they smoke cigarettes, rural Kenyans, rural Chinese, 
almost zero hypertension. Uh, rural Kenyans eating a plant-based diet in their 60s, average BP 110 over 70. And in the same populations that don't have hypertension, they don't tend to have atherosclerosis, they don't get coronary artery disease, they have lower rates of cancer, a lot of good things. Walter Kempner, MD, from Durham, North Carolina, had put about close to 20,000 patients on a rice diet, and he had incredible results. What he was trying to accomplish with that, he had been a kidney researcher before um, taking on these internal medicine patients. He wanted to lower protein that protects the kidneys, low fat that helps prevent diabetes, and low sodium that helps prevent hypertension. He often treated patients with hypertension or with kidney disease. Um, our ancestors, you know, what did they do all day? They probably walked around in extended family groups looking for something to eat, eating plant foods. Uh, we've got herbivore physiology, as we've talked about in other lectures. Relatively little change in blood pressure when you decrease sodium from 10,000 to 3,000 milligrams per day. So that's why you'll hear somebody say, oh, it doesn't really make much difference if you lower your sodium. It doesn't change blood pressure that much. And there is some truth that it doesn't change that much uh, when you go from a super high level of 10,000 milligrams a day to just a high level of 3,000 milligrams per day. But there's a big drop in blood pressure when you go down from about 3,000 milligrams a day per day to 500 milligrams per day or lower. And uh, Walter Kempner especially emphasized that. I actually didn't put, forgot to put the page number in there, but his scientific publications, they're available at drmcdougall.com, and you could read through them. Part one, a lot of it's in a foreign language, but part two, you can get through almost all of it's in English. And that was one of the things that he emphasized is that other doctors told him, oh, so what if you lower sodium? It doesn't make a difference. He says, oh, no, it makes a big difference. So it makes especially a big difference when you get down into the lower numbers. And that's common in the human body, that you have threshold systems that are more activated at certain levels. And sodium is not a placebo. When sodium is hidden in food, um, you have blinded studies and whatnot, it causes hypertension. It's a very real thing. And there can be quite a lot of... Um, sodium in just any type, even relatively mildly processed food, and you get like a breakfast cereal. I was amazed. I went to the grocery store, looked at all the breakfast cereals, and many of them had 200, 300 milligrams of sodium per serving. You know, when I was younger, I'd always eat the whole box, and it turns out there's sodium in milk too, like 120 milligrams per cup. So you can get a heck of a lot of sodium, uh, over 3,000 milligrams very quickly from just eating one box of cereal. Another thing is sodium can cause exercise asthma in some persons. My brother had that situation. My younger brother is a great athlete. He was state champion in freestyle and Greco-Roman wrestling in high school. Then in college, he was a little bit of a disappointment. Everybody expected him to be an All-American, maybe a national champion, and he, he was never even an All-American, which for his ability was a disappointment. Then in his 40s, he became a vegetarian. He started doing jiu-jitsu. He was actually doing jiu-jitsu all along, but when he became a vegetarian, his energy level just improved a lot because his exercise asthma uh, largely resolved and uh, then he became world champion. So, actually, I think he's won a couple world championships. Um, industrial fructose causes increased sodium absorption from the gut. Um, soda pop also has um, sodium in it. They add sodium in there to make you thirsty. Then they kind of hide it with a bunch of sweetener, like high fructose corn syrup. So soda pop is designed to make you drink more. Um, and the fructose not only causes increased sodium absorption from the gut, it'll also cause sodium reabsorption from the kidney. So it's going to have a tendency to volume to increase your uh, sodium in your blood, leading to more volume expansion, leading to more hypertension. Um, sodium is a vasoconstrictor. It narrows arteries. It inhibits endothelial nitric oxide production. Remember, nitric oxide is a super important vasodilator. That's the one Esselstyn talks about all the time. It's the most important positive thing that is done by the arterial lining cells to keep them wide open. Um, and we'll talk more about what sodium does here in some of the uh, coming slides. Um, whenever your body has to balance its amount of cations, positively charged ions. So the more sodium you eat, the more you're, you're going to void out through urination your potassium. And you don't want that. You want more potassium and less sodium you know, compared to what people typically have. Um, you really want your dietary intake of potassium to be at least five times greater than sodium, preferably 10 times greater. And Richard Moore, let me show you his book. This is like the best book by far on hypertension. Um, it's called A High Blood Pressure Solution by Richard Moore, MD, PhD. This guy devoted his entire life to researching hypertension with the emphasis on the sodium potassium membrane pumps and the physiology of sodium and potassium and calcium. And, you know, a lot of these old guys are getting ready to retire. Their research has been somewhat ignored all their life. And 
they put it all together and explain it. And trust me, I've read tons of stuff. This is like the best book. It's a beautiful book. And not only does the physiology of sodium and potassium greatly help one to understand hypertension, one can better understand all kinds of things in the brain and every other organ system in your body because every cell in your body is highly dependent on its plasma membrane potassium sodium pumps for establishing a membrane resting electric potential and it'll use that coupled to other systems to do all kinds of cellular activity and that's not widely known but that's an essential key thing that's not known in med schools but that is like one of the most fundamental important things you could know about cellular function Okay, here's a drawing that's going to really show how stuff works. So here is the potassium sodium ATPase. By the way, K stands for calcium. It's a Latin word for potassium. N stands for natrium. That's the Latin word for sodium. So uh, the nomenclature here is to put the uh, item that's going to come into the cell, the potassium first. So K for K plus for potassium. And two potassiums come into the cell. And then N for Na plus and three sodiums are pumped out of the cell. So you can see with two positive charges coming into the cell from the potassium and then three negative charges going, three positive charges going out of the cell, you're going to have a net effect of pumping out positive charge and that leads to a resting membrane potential of negative 65 millivolts. So the inside of a cell will typically have a negative resting membrane potential and that means that positively charged ions on the ion just means a, a charged electrolyte. Um, so like Sodium is a one plus electrolyte, it's an ion. And the cations are positive, anions are negatively charged. So the point I'm saying is any positively charged ion is gonna to wanna to come into that cell to meet with the negative charge, so to speak. In addition, there's concentration gradients of an individual ion. Uh, because there's much more uh, sodium outside the cell than inside the cell, along its chemical gradient it wants to come into the cell, and as well as electrical gradient to get towards this negative charge over here, the positively charged sodium wants to come into the cell. So there's tons of these KN ATPase pumps all along the plasma membrane of individual cells. It's called ATPase because the pumping action is coupled to energy produced by ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's kind of like the money currency of a cell. ATP is like a $20 bill in a cell for just routine money currency exchanges. By the way, ATP needs magnesium to work, so that's going to come up again as well. But the key point is there's tons and tons of these K and ATPase pumps. In a regular cell, like, you know, one-fourth to one-third of its energy is going to be on the K and ATPase. That's how important it is for the cell. Um, in a neuron in the brain, there's going to be, it could be 65%, two-thirds of the energy of the cell is going to be devoted to the K and ATPase. And the reason is it forms like an energy battery for the entire cell, and all kinds of things can be coupled to the gradients generated by that pump. And so... It's a really important thing. So here, for example, is a calcium exchanger. So it's called a NACA exchanger. Na for uh, sodium, Ka for calcium, and then exchanger. And a lot of times it's abbreviated NCX. So what's happening here is three sodiums come into the cell because they want to, you know, sort of neutralize that gradient of both their chemical concentration and the electrical gradient of the negative charge inside the cell. They're attracted to it. And that then spins the NACA exchanger like a water wheel, which then boots out um, a calcium molecule. And this thing is super fast. It can pump out like 5,000 calciums in a second. So it has to be fast because it has to tightly regulate the calcium concentration in the cell cytoplasm. The calcium concentration in the cell cytoplasm is like a light switch. You know, you flick on the, uh, the light, the light comes on. You flick it off, and that's what calcium does, but you got to control it tight. So it makes a smooth muscle cell contract. It'll make an, a neuron fire an action potential, release a neurotransmitter, and it does other things as well. Regulation of calcium is super important uh, for cellular function, and you can see how this mechanism works. The gradient and the electrical and chemical gradients are established by the K and ATPase, and then other functions are coupled to them. So you don't need to use an ATP over here. However, this is called secondary active transport. Primary active transport and the K and ATPase because it requires an ATP to give off a phosphate and that yields energy. But this is secondary active transport, meaning that it works based on the gradient produced by the primary active transport of the K and ATPase. Okay, this is just showing you the relative concentrations. Like sodium outside the cell is about 140, inside the cell is 14. That's what I meant by a chemical gradient. And it's just the opposite of, with potassium. It's got a much higher concentration inside the cell.
Okay, um, some more detail about the KNATPase. Um, also, calcium from the cytoplasm can be pumped into the endoplasmic reticulum, which is called the sarcoplasm in uh, muscle cells. And that's why the enzyme that uses ATP to pump it is called the circa enzyme for sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. Um, and that's going to come up later. That's very important in the brain in particular. Whenever you've got elevated cytoplasm calcium, it's going to cause contraction, constriction of your smooth muscle cells, leading to narrowing the diameter of your arteries. And that's why sodium causes high blood pressure, because it constricts uh, many arteries, and then the blood pressure has to go up to pump through a constricted system. Okay, now we finally got to the slide that I think most people are going to be most interested in. What should they do about their dietary sodium? First of all, I'll tell you what I do. I try to keep it to a minimum. If there's a little salt in my food, I still eat it anyways, but I try to keep it to the minimum. Now, Dr. McDougall in his book, Salt Solution, which is one of the great all-time nutrition books, says salt and sugar have been blamed for the problems of the SAD diet, standard American diet. They've been scapegoated, but the true main problem is animal foods and oils. And, you know, I, I, I think that's true, but there's more to sodium, okay? Dr. McDougall would tell you, oh, most people, they don't want to lower their sodium all the way down to 500 milligrams a day. They would rather, the typical person would rather take hypertension medications than eat a relatively saltless diet. And I can actually say I think that's true. That's how most people are. But there's also another subset of people, they want to do everything possible to optimize their health, and they're not that fussy. And so I want them to be able to see both sides of the story here, because there's a couple, there's some nuance here that's very useful to know. If you lower your sodium intake, for example, from 4,000 milligrams per day down to 2,300 milligrams per day, that's one teaspoon of sodium, it only lowers systolic blood pressure about one to five points, diastolic about one to three. So that's not much. But there's still things happening in your cells that are important. The way I look at it, hypertension is really a symptom of an excess dietary sodium and a deficiency of potassium as well as an excess dietary fat. It's sort of a, it's not a disease in and of itself. It's a symptom of those um, nutritional problems, okay? And remember, your neurons, 65% of their energy is going to that uh, potassium sodium ATPase, the KN ATPase. So my attitude is I want to make everything as good for them as possible. Um, McDougall's low-fat diet, he says in just seven days, he routinely can get their systolic blood pressure to drop about 15 points, their diastolic to drop about 13 points. And he thinks it's primarily because, you know, they're eating the low-fat diet. And there's more to it. Of course, the plant-based diet has a lot of other good things that help prevent hypertension. It's high in, um, it's high in potassium, vasodilator. It's high in magnesium, vasodilator. It's high in vitamin C, which helps facilitate vasodilation, um, prevents oxidative stress, which can impair vasodilation. And you get the natural nitrates from the greens, leafy greens, like arugula and other salads, Okay. And what Dr. McDougall says is you got to let people put a little salt and sugar on their food so they'll eat it. And the most important thing is that they stop eating animal foods and oils. Um, and these patients, they tend to have pretty good blood pressures. And so I think that's all true. Okay. And that's all good. And, and so what you're basically saying is, you know, the enemy of perfect is good. For most people, just to get a decent, good result, you can get them to switch to eating plant foods. That's great. Their health's going to improve a lot. But what I'm talking about and what I view my audience sort of is like health aristocrats. We want the best possible result. I don't want to just be good. I want to be the best I can be. Okay, and for people who want to know that, then I think it's good. You have to look at extreme situations. Look at Kempner. Kempner took care of much sicker patients than do these other nutritional doctors who are mostly taking care of outpatients, which are, we call them walker talkers, okay? Kempner was taking care of people who were thought to die very soon, imminently, was a significant part of his patient populations. People with very severe hypertension, systolics over 200, people in end-stage kidney failure about to die. And he basically wanted to get that sodium down so low, he would sometimes get it down to 50. That's not a, not a misstatement, 50 milligrams per day. And he found that's about the minimum you could get it down to. And so he also had been a kidney researcher, and kidney is very important for monitoring and controlling the body's acid-base status. So he was very familiar with the idea of trying to lower protein, trying to lower sodium, because sodium is a vasoconstrictor, and it'll constrict the small blood vessels in the kidney and damage kidney function. Um, so what Kempner found was that you might not get that big of a 
lowering of your blood pressure when you come down from 10 grams per day down to 2 grams per day. But man, you go down from 2 grams to 500 milligrams a day and you'll get a dramatic improvement in blood pressure was his experience. And now here's the key point that I see it. Excessive dietary sodium is not just an issue for blood pressure. It also, besides blocking endothelial and nitric oxide, and it can, it's been shown in several studies that there's an impairment of endothelial function, even if you don't have an obvious significant big change in blood pressure. And I want all my endothelial cells functioning optimally. They're part of my blood-brain barrier. I want that stuff all optimal. Um, there's also superoxide dismutase, it's a very important enzyme that helps prevent oxidative stress. And um, dietary sodium will inhibit that. I don't want that. Um, dietary sodium contributes to insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance is mostly due to high dietary fat, but excess dietary sodium contributes to it. I don't want that. So that's another reason where, regardless of the blood pressure, there's reasons why I think it's good to keep one's sodium to a relative minimum. Um, there's also reasons to believe that increased dietary sodium increases the risk of cancer. Um, it, it does things like the chloride in the NaCl of sodium chloride salt will displace bicarbonate ions, leading to a low-grade metabolic acidosis. And then the calcium excretion from the kidneys is coupled to proton excretion such that that's how the pH is rebalanced. But in that process, you know, you're, you're getting calciuria, increasing your risk of kidney stones. Um, and that transient metabolic acidosis might create a cellular milieu of acidosis, which favors cancer growth. In addition, excess dietary sodium switches the cell's equilibrium and increases intracytoplasmic um, calcium, which leads to pumping out of more protons from the cytoplasm into the extracellular matrix. So it, again, it's creating acidosis around the cells. Cancer tends to grow better in that type of milieu, in a localized extracellular matrix acidotic milieu. So you don't want that. In addition, the contribution to insulin resistance, it'll lead to increased insulin in the blood. Insulin is a mitogen stimulating cell division, so it'll promote a positive increased cell division rate. Again, that's slightly uh, promoting cancer, if you will. There's obviously a lot more to cancer than that. We've talked about it in other lectures, and I think the most important thing from a dietary standpoint is avoiding animal protein because that tends to be a tumor promoter. But just you know, be aware that the sodium has a negative aspect there. Because like, let's say I had cancer, one of the things I would want to do is I would want to uh, minimize everything. Um, that might be favorable to cancer. Minimize my dietary sodium. Minimize my animal protein intake. No animal protein intake. Those are some of the things that I would do. So I think it's relevant in that context. And by the way, I always put more detail on my slides for the persons who you know might want to go through them in more detail. Here's just the point about magnesium. Magnesium has a 2 plus positive charge. And so on an ATP, adenosine triphosphate, here's the three phosphates they have a lot of negative charge on them that repels each other. That's why when you pop off a phosphate, there's so much energy from that. So in order to keep them on the ATP, you need the magnesium to bridge them across to balance those negative charge being so close to each other. And that's why you have uh, magnesium as a cofactor with these ATP-related reactions. And that's why you need magnesium. And a lot of people are deficient in magnesium because they don't eat plants. Magnesium primarily comes from plants. Same thing with potassium. So the most common nu nutrient deficiencies in this country are people are low... They're low in potassium, magnesium, and fiber because they don't eat plants, and that's what happens. Okay, now here's Richard Moore. We're going back to his book, The High Blood Pressure Solution. And it's an awesome book, masterpiece. I, I read hundreds of science medical books, and it's one of the best books I ever read. Um, I, like I said, I like these old guys. They're ready to retire. They don't care about anything anymore. They just want to share their legacy with the world, and they put everything together. Any book with multiple authors always stinks. Um, there's no coherence to it, and usually they're a bunch of young junior guys, and they're just, you know, they don't know much, and they're chickens, and they don't say anything interesting. So I usually try to avoid multi-author books unless there's some special reason. Okay, um, the key point of this entire book was that you have to keep your potassium to magnesium, your, your potassium to sodium. It's potassium to sodium ratio at least 5 to 1, preferably 10 to 1, which is easy to do when you eat a plant-based diet. There's some foods that are like 100 to 1 more uh, potassium than sodium. But be aware of that, you know. So if you eat a, something salty like you had to go out for dinner for a special event or a job event, make sure you get some more potassium that day from another source. 
He talked about all the traditional populations, including the Aida people of the Solomon Islands, the Australian Aborigines, the rural Kenyans, the Ugandans, the rural China, Kuna, Tarahumara, Yanomamo, all of these plant-based communities, they all got almost zero hypertension, okay? It's just the way it is. One of the things that, you know, I know a lot of people are confused on the internet because there's like a, ma a million nonsense paleo, keto, low-carb videos for every vegan video. So people wonder, well, gee, what's what's really true about nutrition? Just look at epidemiology. It's, it's obvious, okay? Plant-eating populations are skinny and healthy. Meat and processed food eating populations are fat and sick. Okay, uh, hyperglycemia is a symptom of insulin resistance. Back pain is a symptom largely of ischemia due to causing degenerative disc disease. And the point like we made here is that hypertension is a symptom of uh, deficiency of potassium and magnesium and excess of dietary sodium, also an excess of dietary fat. Okay, um, we talked about increasing insulin resistance. We talk about it being associated with a tendency for cell division and a low-grade metabolic acidosis, possible increase in cancer risk, the chlorides displaced in the bicarbonate. So those are all reasons why it's good to keep your um, sodium, in my opinion, to a minimum, um, even if it's not making that big a blood pressure difference in that range of, you know, from 10 grams down to 2 grams. Okay, food content and labels. Just a couple quick points about nutrient labels. Um, the key point is plant foods are low in sodium, high in magnesium. And just for example, oatmeal. Oatmeal's got 150 milligrams of potassium, zero of sodium. So look at that. You got at least a 150 to 1 ratio. Pretty good. You're going to have no problem with your blood pressure with that. Look at potatoes. About zero calories from fat. Sodium zero uh, per serving, so I'm sure it's like 0.4 or something. Uh, potassium, 620 milligrams. Okay, I mean, those are incredible numbers. That's why I love potatoes. That's why I think potatoes are the best food in the whole world. These are incredible numbers. Just to give you some comparison, let's say you talk about salmon, you know, the fish, salmon. That's about 50% protein and 50% fat. Animal protein and animal fat are like two toxins. There's no carbohydrates in uh, animal foods other than milk, okay? So the, the point is you can't win with those numbers. You're, you're screwed if you're eating things that are in that ballpark, all that fat, all that animal protein. Okay, breakfast cereal, a typical breakfast cereal will have like maybe let's say 100 milligrams per serving of potassium, 200 of sodium. So twice as much sodium or more. Some of them have 300 milligrams per serving, two or three times as much sodium per potassium. Those are going to predispose you to high blood pressure. They're bad. they got a lot of calcium in them, too, which you don't want. We talked about it in my epidemiology lecture on the Bantu. Americans eat way too much calcium. It, it doesn't do them any good. It's bad for their health. Okay. Um, in general, the more processed the food, the lower the potassium content, the more sodium it's going to have. So I recommend no processed food. Processed food stinks. You can't win with it because... It almost always has MSG in it, and it's almost always as high in sodium, and then there's a lot of times other things in there, preservatives and stuff you don't want. My recommendation, zero processed food. The only semi-processed food I'll eat is oatmeal. Um, the less processed, the better. I'll only eat plain oatmeal. Um, the amount of positive charge inside an individual cell is kept constant. The body has to uh, balance all of its cations and anions. It always has to maintain an overall charge equilibrium. And the point being is whenever you eat more sodium, you're going to lose potassium for your body. And vice versa. You eat more potassium, you're going to lose some sodium. It's extremely unlikely to ever, unless you're a kidney failure patient, you know, see your doctor if, you, if you're if you on hypertensive medicines or if you think you might be a kidney patient or whatever. But I'm just letting you know, the typical walker-talker person, uh, we're made to you know save and retain um, sodium and excrete potassium because our ancestors, that's what they ate. They ate tons of potassium and relatively little uh, sodium in comparison. Okay, we've talked about stress in other lectures, but the key point is cortisol and catecholamines are the hormones increased with stress. Uh, stress equivalents are lack of sleep and caffeine. And the bottom line is they will increase kidney reabsorption of sodium, so they're going to drive up your blood pressure. And they also cause loss of magnesium in the urine which is also going to tend to increase blood pressure. Okay, what can you do to help prevent high blood pressure? Like we said, minimize your dietary sodium intake. The best way to do that is to avoid um, eating processed foods completely. And like McDougall said, a little bit of salt on your food is probably not going to hurt you too much. If you're trying to optimize things, then you want to essentially don't add any salt. I've had some friends who've thrown away their salt shakers and their blood pressure's improved a lot. Um, Let's see, eat your plants and get your vasodilators, your potassium and your magnesium. Uh, you also have vitamin C, protecting you from oxidative stress. 
um, the natural nitrates in plant foods like arugula and other salads. And again, try to keep that ratio. I, I actually never think about these ratios. I never even look it up. I know from knowing what's in my diet that my ratio is probably like 100 to 1 potassium to sodium, okay? And that's good. Um, optimize your body weight. The fatter a person is, the more likely they're hypertensive and diabetic. Uh, quite often, early diabetes, as we well know, and prediabetes, it can all be reversed. Just minimize your dietary fat and minimize your dietary sodium. Um, avoid processed food. Avoid canned foods. I don't like canned foods because they tend to be heavily salted. The inner lining tends to have BPA on it. There's tears in the BPA, contact in food with aluminum. Then you can get aluminum and BPA in your food. You don't want that. Uh, no oils, not one drop. No sweets. I recommend avoiding that. I recommend avoiding caffeine or any stimulants. No alcohol. That's what I recommend. Keep it to a minimum. Um, so there's some medications that can also raise blood pressure. Um, avoid estrogenics in general. We've talked about estrogenics in other lectures. That contributes to making people get fat. Um, manage your stress, try to exercise more. That helps to uh, keep your blood pressure down. But remember, diet's the most important thing. You can't outrun a bad diet. So make sure the diet's good. And then you just add exercise to make yourself even healthier. Okay, and this is something from the talk on excitotoxicity, meaning that the sodium, the potassium sodium ATPase here maintains the resting memory and potential in neurons. Let's say this is the hippocampus memory center of the brain. And the more calcium you have coming into the cytoplasm, the more glutamate excitatory neurotransmitter is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and activate the postsynaptic neuron. And what I'm basically saying is the higher your dietary sodium, the more calcium you're going to have stuck in this cytoplasm of the presynaptic neuron, meaning the more glutamate you're going to release. That's going to increase the risk of excitotoxicity, increase the risk of anxiety, increase the risk of insomnia. And then you start adding to that things like excessive dietary excitotoxins like MSG, manufactured glutamate, um, excitatory amino acid neurotransmitters like aspartate and aspartame, and then the person is stressed out. All of these things are contributing to increased metabolic demand on that postsynaptic neuron. And if you couple that to uh, poor oxygen delivery and blood supply because of eating a lot of dietary fat and vasoconstriction for sodium, you can see how you're basically ruining life for this postsynaptic neuron. You're increasing its metabolic demand. You're increasing the metabolic demand of that postsynaptic neuron while simultaneously dropping um, the oxygen and glucose supply. And so it's going to have a hard time for that neuron to survive. It might go into programmed cell death called apoptosis. And that's a very common way for people to become demented. I look at brains all the time, and the most common thing I see is an atrophic brain. So we're just finishing up here, but I thought it was nice to connect the two subjects there. Okay, and then we already talked about this, you know, the idea of the mouse, you know, the vascular hypothesis of dementia, whereby anything that deprives the brain of blood flow or oxygen or glucose is going to increase the risk of dementia. And simultaneously, anything that drops, um, that increases the metabolic demand is going to increase the risk of dementia. So the typical person is basically self-inflicted, destroying their brain every day. They're sleep deprived, they drink caffeine, um, they eat a diet that increases the metabolic demands of their neurons while simultaneously dropping the oxygen supply, and then they often end up fat, diabetic, with sleep apnea, and all of these things uh, predispose to dementia. I see tons of people that are demented in their 50s. I see a significant number demented in their 40s, in their 60s, of course. So what I'm saying is if you want to keep yourself smart and sharp and energetic, um, you know, do the things we talked about on that slide about preventing hypertension. So, uh, let's see, I think I maybe got one more slide here. Oh, just have some references, some of the things we talked about. So, anyways, I uh, hope that was helpful.